All right, I'd like to welcome everybody today to the Lunch and Learn. As you can tell, I'm not Catherine Gray. Uh, I'm Brad Wagner, and I'm a TA specialist with uh, Community and Culture Outreach. I'm filling in for her today. Um, we're going to get right to our presentation. Um, today we have uh, Tanya Hogner Weevil. She's going to be talking to you guys about uh, tear dresses. Uh, Tanya Hogner Weevil was born in Perryton, Texas. She has on here, don't tell anybody I'm a Texan. <laughs> but I just did. And she was raised in Hardesty, Oklahoma in the Panhandle. Her parents were Jeff and Florine Hogner. Her dad grew up in the Fairfield community. And her mother is from the Oklahoma Panhandle. Her grandmother, Katie Ketcher Hogner, was born in Peavine near Stillwell, Nader County. Tanya is a single mother to two sons, Ryder Redbird and Parker Star Weevil. Uh, both are in college. Tanya grew up in a very small school and graduated with six others in her class. She learned how to sew in home economics, which she took with every other girl in the high school for four years. She loved crafting, needlework, and sewing. She competed in the Miss Cherokee pageant and had Cherokee National Treasure Youth Ruth England make her dress. It was from her example that she began to make her own dresses. Tanya was asked by Wendell Cochran, also a Cherokee National Treasure, to make dresses for the Cherokee Youth Choir and thus begun a lifelong friendship fostered around tear dresses. Wendell acted as a mentor to her and taught her everything she knows about making and fitting tear dresses. Tanya said she is so grateful he shared his incredible knowledge with her. Tanya was designated as a Cherokee National Treasure in 2012 in textiles. She continues to sew for the Cherokee Youth Choir and has been fortunate to make tear dresses for many of the Miss Cherokee ambassadors. She has a deep interest in researching Cherokee clothing and has made costumes for several Cherokee-based productions. Today, she enjoys making modern clothing with hints of our past embedded in the style and design. Tanya is currently the education director at the Cherokee Heritage Center and has a long history working there. She's been a dancer in the Trail of Tears drama, as well as worked in the box office. She has been a village guide and a ticket seller, and has loved all her time spent on the grounds of the Cherokee Heritage Center. So without any further ado, Tanya Hogner Weevil. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here today. I was asked to speak on Cherokee tear dresses, and although um, I'm not the master, um, I studied under the master. Um, you can't talk about Cherokee tear dresses unless you mention Wendell Cochran's name. Wendell um, was there at the beginning, and he's still there, um, having a strong and definite influence on Cherokee tear dresses. Um, we'll talk more about him. There's a couple of other names that you can't speak about the Cherokee tear dress without mentioning Virginia Stroud, and so we'll talk about her a little further down. Uh, in the presentation today. Again, it's my pleasure to be here. I have made 600 tear dresses probably. Wow. I've made a lot of tear dresses. And um, <clears throat> uh, what's prompted that has been the Cherokee Youth Choir. Um, they have about 50 uh, choir members off and on. And I started sewing for them. Mm. I don't remember the year. I think 2007. Oh, I'm probably telling you false information. Um, but since the inception of the Cherokee Youth Choir, I can tell you this. My children are 19 and 20 years old, and they were not in school when I started, and they slept at my feet um, through the night because I'm a night owl, and I prefer to sew from about 10 p.m. till about 3 a.m. That's my prime time. And so my babies would make a pallet on the floor beside me and sleep beside me. So um, it's my pleasure again. And so let's talk about tear dresses. Uh, the tear dress is the official dress of the Cherokee Nation Ambassador, Miss Cherokee. Not only Miss Cherokee, but Junior Miss Cherokee and many of our young ambassadors. Um, I forget what they call them. They're not little Mr. and Miss, but they were when I started making them. Now they're, they're termed another term. Um, but these young women, I love to sew for them and I love to put them in beautiful and colorful dresses because to me these young women are the epitome of Cherokee women. Young, strong, independent, smart and uh, I always enjoy dressing them to look their best. 
the Cherokee tear dress is a, an unusual dress. It was um, designated as the official dress and not necessarily by legislation but by recommendation of the council. We're probably the only tribe that has a designated dress for our young women. Um, and they wear them proudly. Here is a couple of uh, dresses that I made. Um, the one on this, the, these two, I don't, I don't have the picture, but these two dresses had an American doll, uh, American girl doll that I made miniature dresses matching the youth dresses. That was a fun project. All pieces of the tear dress are squares ret or rectangles except for the neckline. The fabric is torn, thus calling it a tear dress. Um, I had a fellow one time <clears throat> who was kind of cranky, and he said, well, I'd like to meet somebody that makes a tear dress the old way, the way they just tear the dresses. And I said, you're looking at one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, do a little sample. Now, when you get fabric, and this is cotton. Most tear dresses are made from cotton, although they don't have to be made from cotton. But the tear dress, that, I mean the fabric I have here is cotton. And when you buy it from the store, they cut it for you and it looks straight and they want it to be straight because they're, you know, doing their best as a salesperson. But when you do, you cut through the selvage edge, which is the binding edge, and you just clip, well, you do all your measurements and you measure down however many inches you're going to go. And you clip the selvage edge and you literally tear the fabric. And what happens is, it tears straight. <sighs> so, it is a huge time-saving effort when you're getting ready to make a tear dress. So typically what I do is I get my measurement charts, I make all my measurements, I go down the list, I measure 15 inches, clip, 24 inches, clip, and then I come back through and I rip and tear all of the, of, of the pieces. It's wonderful. If you make a satin, or a tear dress out of fabric that does not tear, it's work because it is very hard to cut a straight line in a tear dress. So that's just a sample. The origin of the tear dress, it is a myth, I'm sorry to bust your romantic bubble, but it is a myth that the Cherokee women wore tear dresses on the removal or on the Trail of Tears. Um, there's a reason why we associate it. Uh, and we can, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we did not wear the tear dress style on the removal. It was probably made and worn at about the beginning and end of the Civil War, perhaps 1850 forward. Um, the first dress was made for Virginia Stroud in 1970. And we'll, Wendell Cochran, again, is the tear dress master. Um, the tear dress is a utilitarian dress. Without a doubt, it is a working woman's dress, the way it's made. <clears throat> here is, <laughs> here is the first tear dress. Um, about, well, it was uh, last summer, not this summer, but the preceding summer, we did a Miss Cherokee exhibit at the Cherokee Heritage Center. And we had about 30 tear dresses in the gallery. I was in hog heaven. It was beautiful, it was wonderful. All of these women who had made these gorgeous tear dresses, Ruth England, Lorene Drywater, um, many others, had, it, it was so wonderful. And you could see their styles. You could identify, oh yes, Lorene Drywater is famous for hand stitching the diamonds. She would, she would hand stitch all of the diamonds on the yoke, the sleeves, and the skirt, that's her trademark. And they're beautiful, they're tiny little intricate diamonds. Um, but this particular dress is what we refer to as, well, the curator, I'll just tell you, the curator came to me and he said, Tanya, we have the holy grail of tear dresses. <laughs> the first tear dress is coming. And Virginia Stroud um, was generous enough to loan her dress for us to exhibit. And this is it. Um, it it's, just, it's just beautiful. Um, let's see. Here she is um, in it. And 
I'm going to read to you. I'm sorry, but this is, this is too wonderful not to, to share. We never saw the trunk, but I'll never forget one item it contained. We learned about the trunk the year Miss Cherokee entered the competition for Miss Indian America, which was to be held in Sheridan, Wyoming. One of the paramount qualifications for eligibility was to appear in tribal attire. Northern and Western tribal women had their elegant fringed and beaded buckskin dresses, and in the Southwest, the Navajos had brilliant velveteen blouses and satin skirts accessorized with silver jewelry, and on the Southern Plains, the women of many tribes had developed a colorful ceremonial cloth dress, which was more comfortable than traditional buckskin in the hot summer weather. In 1970, the Cherokees were still in the early stages of reestablishing the Cherokee Nation. A new national awareness was emerging and it was finding an expression in many ways. One of those was the appointment of a committee to choose a style of dress, hopefully for, Miss, for Cherokee ceremonial occasions, but specifically for Miss Cherokee to wear at the um, Miss Indian America contest. Those named on the committee by W.W. Keeler were Winona Day, Anna Gritz Kilpatrick Smith, Marie Hayes Wadley, and Elizabeth Walters Higgins. Each had done separate research and then met to share findings and agree on a specific style of garment. We met in the workroom of the Cherokee Nation gift shop. It was a warm day. The first decision was the easiest. Any of the buckskin clothing worn in the South and in the 16th century and earlier would not be acceptable to Cherokee women or to contest judges in the 20th century, since most of those items were short wraparound skirts only. <laughs> Full body tattoos were quickly passed on as well. With serious intent, we began to examine our information. From the written record, drawings, and photographs, it became apparent that a cloth dress would be appropriate but which dress and from all those past years? Which cloth, wool trade cloth, muslin, calico? Had we missed something? One more look at another document, a photograph or a description. Then in what I think of as true Cherokee demeanor, Winona Day quietly told us she had brought along something we might be interested to see. It was in an unassuming manner that she told us that she had brought a dress. We eagerly urged her to show it to us. While she unwrapped the dress, she further explained that this particular dress had been made from one found in an old trunk, and it was believed to have been made in the style of dresses worn at the time of the Trail of Tears. We were all excited and all started talking at the same time, commending Winona for bringing the dress, questioning why she'd waited so long to tell us she had it. Then suddenly, we all hushed. In silence, we watched as it was placed in the, on the conference table. Each woman reached out to help unfold the dress, to touch it, to shape a sleeve, to, move, to smooth the skirt, or to straighten the hem. <clears throat> it seemed we held our collective breaths and viewed the dress. In a moment, we all started talking again, all at the same time. It was clear that the unanimous feeling was, here it is. We congratulated Winona one another and Winona again. <coughs> Suddenly we became aware of Marie saying that she had to sit down. Our attention turned to her as she explained that, she, that the excitement was too much and that she ought to take some medication for her heart. We rested a bit, calmed down, and again all admired the dress. It was made of dark calico cotton with a subdued or faded floral linear pattern. The color was primarily a dark blue green there was an applique pattern of diamonds on the yoke and around the skirt just above the flounce. This dress had snaps instead of buttons. The sleeves were three-quarter length and the skirt length at mid-calf. This was an everyday dress, a style to accommodate a busy homemaker and mother. The sleeve length did not get in the way of washing dishes or clothes, and the skirt did not gather dust or dirt from, the outside, the, from outside, and neither did it become damp from the dew-covered grass, a very practical dress. Open down the front to oblige a nursing mother and easy to put on for those who had no help with fasteners down the back. Dresses for little girls open down the back. To allow additional ease of movement, the dress had a gusset under each armhole. All pieces of the dress were designed to be torn because not all Cherokee women had scissors 
when they first had access to cotton fabric. Each dress part was torn on the straight of the material and then sewn together, thus the name tear dress. Our enthusiasm over being introduced to this remarkable garment turned to awe as we reflected on its significance. This was the style of dress worn by our grandmothers and by reintroducing it to today's Cherokee women, it would provide an opportunity to pay homage to the unforgettable experiences of those courageous women, to create a wearable memorial in commemoration and celebration. We hope that each time a tear dress was worn, it would be worn with pride, self-respect, and in a manner becoming of Cherokee women. And yes, the first new tear dress was made for Miss Cherokee and worn by her when she was crowned Miss Indian America 13. The dress was made by Elizabeth Walters Higgins for her sister, Virginia Alice Stroud in 1970. So, um, it's a little bit touching to me. Um, I've talked to Don Stroud, who is Virginia's brother, and who has a con uh, accompanied her and escorted her on many of her adventures. And he said to me, even if the dress were not made exactly in the style, it was made in the spirit of Cherokee women and their dedication and their um, integrity. And I just thought that that was, oh, it just made it all the more special. Um, so sometimes we become immune to seeing this dress but it actually does stand for a lot, stands for our grandmothers. Virginia Stroud, this is a little bit about her story. She competed in the Miss Cherokee competition in 1969 to win the cash prize to help her with college, and she won, and I believe it was $50, which in the day probably paid for college, I don't know. But um, I've spoken to her and she said that was really the only reason she needed the money and so she competed for the money. When she won Miss Cherokee, the tribe automatically entered her in the Miss Indian Oklahoma contest in 1970. She was very close with the Autone family, which are Kiowas, and wore the Kiowa-style buckskin dress to compete. She won the Miss Indian Oklahoma contest, and then she represented Oklahoma in the Miss Indian America contest, again, which she also won. And in that Miss Indian Oklahoma, it's the first time she wore the tear dress, the red tear dress that you saw earlier. Curiously enough, now there I see some I see some gray hairs in this room, and so I know some of you remember the Trail of Tears drama. Um, it was a huge had a huge impact on the economy in northeastern Oklahoma, and set um, the the stage for the Cherokee Heritage Center which is, uh, the location is based on the site for the first female seminary. That's the historic part of the Cherokee Heritage Center. But as you may or may not know, the drama helped us know what the tear dress was and also misplaced our memory to think that that dress is associated with the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears drama opened in 1969 with top-notch directors, choreographers, and costumers, some from New York City. The costumer and Mr. and Mrs. Hagerstrands, the founders of the Heritage Center, both agreed upon the tear dress as the women's costume for the drama. They were able to convince Mrs. Day to bring her dress for them to examine and make a pattern. Mrs. Day was very protective of the dress and did not let it out of her sight. The New York costumer measured and made notes as Mrs. Hagerstrand, a talented seamstress herself, watched. After the first season of the show, the costumer returned to New York City, taking with her all the dress notes. Wendell Cochran was hired as the costumer designer in 1970, and with Marion Hagerstrand's input, they together constructed the tear dress as the women's costume for the show. Wendell's skills and Marion's memory finessed the tear dress to what we know today. So in our history, as we like to think of us as strong, stoic, historic people, the Trail of Tears drama has a big part in the history of the tear dress. That's where it was mostly worn. Um, it was altered to be a costume. Many of them had zippers 
so you could take them off and make a quick costume change. They were made out of um, cotton, so they were easily laundered because this is when the show was showing six days a week. So there were, sir, I was in the drama, and in 1974 was my first year, and there were days that you washed some, every day there was laundry being done. It was a different costume that was being washed each, each day of the week. <clears throat> Wendell told me that um, on some of the older, heavier women, when they put the dress on and walked, he noticed that the skirt hiked in the back or it didn't fit quite right, or it was blousy in the front. And that's when he began to customize the dresses to fit the people. And he has taught me how to do that. And um, a lot of times um, when you purchase a tear dress in the store or gift shops carry them, or sometimes someone else will have one that you purchase, um, it may not fit you quite right because every dress is customized to fit that person. Every dress I make is custom. I don't have a warehouse full of tear dresses that I can go and pull one out to fit you. I only do custom fittings and custom making. So Wendell understood that. Wendell, he's just the best. He has a strong concept of dress form fitting, how, um, how you alter clothing, um, how you make clothing fit yourself, which was very uh, commonly done when we all made our own clothes. Um, now we take a shirt that hangs off our sleeves or pants that may be too long and we turn them up and staple them down. And you know, we, we make uh, adjustments today, but in the day, clothes were made just to fit you. Um, Let's see what I have next. Um, this is a picture of Wendell and the tear dress on a model uh, for a fashion show that was done at the NSU Symposium. I don't know the year. I'm sorry, I don't know the year. But Wendell organized uh, a fashion show. Um, in doing that, in learning to make the dress fit you, it changed the whole concept of tear dress making. Here's a picture of the youth choir. The youth choir kids have worn these tear dresses since its inception. When the, the choir was first uh, started, it was the Cherokee Children's Choir, and they were children, fifth and sixth graders. And then as those kids grew up, then it became the youth choir, and now I, I don't know how young you can be. I think it's seventh or eighth grade, probably ninth grade, but the majority of their kids are older, older high school students and they wear the tear dress as part of their performance. And the boys wear ribbon shirts, as you can see, um, and red. They're, they're Wendell designed, he was the designer of the, of the choir's outfits. Um, I've never seen a picture of uh, a tear dress from the 1800s. And we had cameras, and we had ways to capture images but I've never seen a tear dress that we know of today then. Um, we say it's a utilitarian dress. It opens down the front. Um, wealthy women had people that dressed them, thus they, their clothes were buttoned in the back. Um, all of those things that I said earlier about the tear dress being a utilitarian dress. The bodice is attached to the skirt, so there's no fear of your shirt coming out uh, to be modest to cover your midriff. Um, and um, what I have found, however, is you can see this nice little yoke. We see that as a very common factor. And on this little sweet baby, the yoke, um, you can see the baby has no nothing here. So the baby's clothes close in the back. The women's clothes, there's an opening here. But they still have this square yoke um, that fits just like a tear dress does. Again, tear dresses are custom fitted or bespoken. Bespoken meaning uh, by arrangement. Um, the fabrics and the color designs are absolutely your choice. Um, and there's a lot of choices. <laughs> Here's a few dresses. 
uh, you can see the different style. The one in the center is made from camouflage fabric and a five-pointed star. It was worn at a Cherokee veteran's powwow. And so it was made specifically for that particular event. Some have diamonds and some have stars. I'll talk to you a little bit about how to make a dress. Um, the tear dress is not for the novice seamstress. You have to know a few things before you sew. And I've taught a few tear dress classes, and it can be very lengthy because it, even for me, um, from beginning to end, it takes me about 12 hours. And that's if I'm just absolutely dedicated to it. By the time you measure, you figure your measurements, you cut your fabric, you do the diamond pattern, you add your ribbon, and you stitch the dress up, you get it hemmed, you get the buttons put on. It's, it's a 10 or 12 hour project, and I don't know why, but the older I get, the slower I get. I don't know what that is. You'd think I would know all the shortcuts by now, but sometimes I don't. The um, tear dress is uh, a yoke fitted to the shoulders and the neckline of the woman. What makes a tear dress a tear dress is this wonderful stand-up ruffle on the, uh, the yoke and sleeves and the flounce or the bottom ruffle. It should be a stand-up ruffle that is stitched on the outside of the dress, thus making it a tear dress. Some people use ribbon only and that is absolutely your choice to do that. However, Wendell says it's a lazy woman's way of making a tear dress because you have to, these diamonds are associated with, with uh, our, our dress. Um, ribbon is uh, stitched as designed and um, what makes the tear dress the tear dress is this lovely gusset. Now it looks like a triangle from that angle and I don't know if you can see it, but it's actually a square sewn into the uh, underside of the sleeve and the underside of the bodice and it gives you full range of motion. Our Miss Cherokee can turn cartwheels and flips if she so chooses because she has full range of motion with her arms to um, reach over her head. So it's very very practical dress. We've turned it into a formal dress. Um, what was once three-quarter length has now become long. The sleeves have become long for a more formal look and, and again, the length has become long. When you measure and when you get ready, you take this many measurements, or I do, maybe I should just qualify it. I take this many measurements. I have to know how wide you are from here to here, how long to make your yoke, what your front waist measurement is from here to here, what your waist measurement is, how far you are from here to the floor in the front, and in the back because that's often a different measurement. Um, as we age and grow older, and even young some, sometimes it's not even. You can, you, it doesn't, it turns out to be even. You might be 15 inches here and you might be 13 inches in the back, but you might be two inches shorter in your hem line. So it's made to fit you so that that hem lays, um, sits even off the floor and you're fitted to the waist and that those are important things. Then when you figure your measurements you have to add the ruffle and you have to add uh, the measurement to ensure that you have an inch ruffle that stands and you have to have something under it to catch it. So it's an inch up and an inch down and a half inch for seam allowance. So there's there are many things you do in order to get um, the correct measurements and get your pattern pieces the right size. <coughs> One of the mark, key markers of a tear dress is the diamond. I don't know the history of the diamond. Um, a lot of times we have a basket pattern that has a diamond. We call it the chief's daughter's design. We use it very frequently and we refer to it. Um, but to be honest with you, I think it is purely decorative. Um, but the diamond is the most common. It can be a square diamond, it can be an oblong diamond, and you can see here that there's, uh, there's, this is the beginning of getting all of the embellishment put on the dress. I'll show you how to do a diamond because many people ask me, it's, it's, 
it's really easy. Um, it looks difficult and it is time consuming, don't get me wrong. Um, everything about the tear dress is time consuming. But when you take a piece of fabric, you mark on the back side your diamond. And then you take your scissors and you cut to each point of the diamond. And you've marked these and they're even on your, on your contrast strip so that you know exactly where you're going. And you, you clip to each of the corners of the diamond so you have, you have a piece like so. And then you take your handy glue stick, your washable glue stick, and you glue the edges and you fold it back. Of course, I didn't bring my glue stick today. But you fold it back, you press it with a hot iron, and your diamond, then, it, I'm not having a hard time showing you, then there's your diamond pattern in your fabric. And it's as simple as that. And then all you do is top stitch it to hold it in place with a contrast color underneath it. So what, you, what looks difficult really is not. Here are some options and choices. Not just diamonds, but we have, um, and I'm happy to kind of go beyond diamonds. Um, I think that we should personalize our clothing and it should reflect us. <coughs> It always has in our history. We've always personalized our clothing and made them our own. We didn't have a strict standard for being uniform or being alike. We actually thrived in being different and, and uh, uh, um, showcasing what made us unique. So in this particular, there are several of these pictures. You can see I did this seven-pointed star. Actually, I don't think I was the first person to do it. Gail Ross told me that she had a seven-pointed star dress made in the early 80s, and that was before me. So using the seven-pointed star is fairly common, and you can see there's variations and patterns to that particular dress, to, that, to the star. Here's yet another. I stitched the star in the center to show all the lines of the stars. Um, and you can see in the one, in, in this one, I've used a different color so you can see, you can see the, the stitching. Um, this is just, just another color combination. This lady asked for a red bird. She had red diamonds, but she asked for a red, one red bird on the front of her skirt, so I obliged. And this young woman has had, this is the yoke of the dress the shoulder of the dress. And then she asked for hummingbirds. So she had hummingbirds and diamonds placed on her dress. Um, more seven-pointed stars. And this, this star right here, is a happy accident that I must tell you about. <laughs> I um, had cut stars out in different sizes and I, and I was gonna stack them like like this one up here. I was just going to put all four of them stacked up. And um, I use Wonder Under because the more uh, things that are out there available to use to make your job easier, I'm, that's what I'm about. So if you're looking at me to be absolute traditional, I'm not. I'll use every cost cutting, cost, I mean, time saving um, material available to me. And that's stitch witchery, I think. And so stitch witchery is paper, and you draw your design, you iron it onto your fabric, and then you peel the paper off, and you have a second adhesive thing that you can then iron onto whatever you're stitching on. So I had all my stars lined up, and I took them to my uh, ironing board, and I was going to very, be very careful to place them just right, because once you iron them, you can't un-iron them. And as I go, I pushed, I brushed aside, and those four stars turned on this angle, and I just went, oh, maybe, you know, that's what I need to do. So this was a happy accident, and the way it turned out was, I thought, very in intriguing and interesting. So that kind of became a signature of mine for a few years. This is a dress that I made. And um, it was orange satin. I don't like to sew with satin, but I did. 
And it's, it's this great dress. It was for, I think, Miss Cherokee at the time. This dress was made for Christy Kingfisher. And she had someone um, mm, embroider, machine embroider, the clans. And so we put the clans in each of the stars on her dress. That was her request and a unique thing to do. I think this is one of my favorite, favorite things I did last summer. This is a wedding dress. I've made several people, people's wedding dresses. But this particular one, I just really, really liked. Um, I thought she picked good fabric and she had a good eye for um, color. And then I also made her bridesmaids dresses, which were um, monochromatic. Usually I say to people, you want colors that pop and you can see the ribbon. And, but I thought in this instance, I thought it was very, um, a very nice touch for her wedding. Here's a picture of me, much young, many years ago, much younger, and the girls were too. Um, this is Shelby and Shanoa Turtle. They're now high school aged about, uh, Shelby is. And um, I've sewn for them since they were babies. And so this particular dress, I often made their dresses alike, and um, their mom really liked the stars. Here's the first dress. This was my happy accident dress. And I chose um, the primary colors because I like bright. I prefer bright and, and uh, bold. And um, a museum in Indianapolis purchased this from the art show. So that, that's kind of cool. And then this particular dress is uh, velveteen. And it was the first time I had ever actually pleated instead of gathered. I pleated the um, gathers and I pleated it into the waistband. And this dress was made for Lanice Belcher, who is a good friend of mine. And um, she was Junior Miss Cherokee and it was her Christmas dress. And um, I love Lanice and I love her family. But I was really wanting to make a velvet dress. I was wanting to make an emerald green velvet dress. And that's a, that, that's a big deal. And so her mom said, I'll buy it. But she bought velveteen instead of velvet. And if you know, velveteen is like uh, lounge stretch pants. And it moved like this every time I went to work with it. It was difficult to work with. But I thought the dress turned out beautifully. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of examples. Um, this is, again, the seven-pointed star. Um, placed on a dress. You can see it's, uh, it has, I think, good color. A lot of it depends on color. On this particular dress, a blue ribbon was placed on top of a white ribbon to give it a little extra oomph. And then I've been, I made these just recently. Here is a baby's dress. And you can see it does, it buttons in the back and it just hangs straight. And I like to um, add a growth tuck, so I do a little extra and fold it under where the ribbons are so as the baby grows. And this particular dress has a really heavy big hem because this baby's going to grow. It's not going to stay this size very long. And more often than not, your yoke will fit, but your sleeves will get shorter and your hem will get shorter. And tear dresses aren't cheap. So I know when you buy for your child, you want it to last more than two wearings. So I try to do that. I think that's a fun little dress. This particular dress, the young lady was adamant to have stars. She chose her colors, and I accommodated her colors. So this is, this is a nice little dress. She's about seven. And then her sister is about 10, and this is her dress. And orange and purple were her colors. So you can see that you can just do about any color combo or color scheme. And this dress is the mom's. And she wanted gold and um, red. And so it makes a nice dress. So tear dresses are an expression of your personality and your, per and, and your, your thoughts about um, 
fashion. It's also uh, very much the Cherokee woman's uh, wear today. We have started uh, going back to maybe the 1700s and wearing the 1700 clothing style, but I think the tear dress is enduring and will last forever. We'll see it on our Miss Cherokees always. And um, I, I think it's, again, as Winona Day, I mean, as Miss Higgins said in her piece, it really is a legacy to the Cherokee women to be worn with dignity and pride. And so with that, I'll conclude my presentation. <laughs> but I'll be happy to take questions if you have questions. Wow. It's an old same jacket. Yeah, she referred to it as our, our aunt, as a his hunting shirt, I think yeah. is what she called it. Great but Granny has on a Victorian style dress. Right. He has the, the shirt with the jacket with the diamond. Oh, I would love to see that picture. I'll be happy to, to share that. Um, women's fashion changed much quicker than men's did. Men's uh, and women's fashion went, we didn't actually have a style or a fashion like our men did with the hunting jacket and um, that lasted a lot longer. We were dressing, we were already assimilated in our dress probably before the removal, probably by the 1800s. So um, it's not uncommon to see the men dressed and even when we did dress, the, the men were the male birds, colorful and beautiful, and the women were more plain like the female birds. So that's we followed nature in that regard. Any other questions? On that little dress with like a six or seven year old. Mm -hmm. The baby? So, no, not the baby one. This one? Uh, yeah. So since she's a little girl, she would wear it with a button in the back? No, actually I made this one to button in the front because it has a waistband. I encourage mothers, um, especially those that compete in the little ambassador, a competition to wear uh, the dress, the full open dress. But we want to make our little girls look like little women and so we do these waistbands and that that pretty much indicates the dress will be in the front. I usually do a three-piece waist and on the choir everything can change. The waist size is a three-piece waistband where you can expand or let it out. The hem has a big heavy, like this hem is a big heavy three inch hem which is not typical, but you want a heavy hem anyway to, to weight the dress down so, it, so it'll wear well. But um, we do three quarter length sleeves so that if your arms grow, it doesn't really make that much difference if you're here or here or here. So um, this particular dress is made to button in the front because of the waistband. And again, there's a tab on the waistband. I don't, I don't know why we do that. That's just something that we do. Did you ever hear the story about the mother who cut the end of the end of the ham off? She cut the ends of the ham off before she cooked it. And so the daughter cook, cut the ends of the ham off before she cooked it. And the granddaughter cut the ends of the ham off before she cooked it. And someone said, why do you do that? I said, I don't know, my mom did. Mom, why'd you do that? I don't know, my mom did. Granny, why did you do that? So we'll fit in the pan. <laughs> that's that's kind of like this this flap. Why do you do it? Because it's always been done. We don't have a reason necessarily that we have this little two inch flap on the waistband. Okay. Any other questions? Wonderful. Thank you so much. You've been a terrific audience. I appreciate it.